Well, Lord, once again, I thank you for the opportunity of just being able to spend a little bit of time just sharing your word this morning, Lord. I pray that, as always, that you would open our hearts and minds to receive the seed of your word. And as always, Lord, I acknowledge that any error is mine and that all glory and that all honour is, is yours. Amen. So... We're going to carry on and crack back into this parable, the parable of the faithful steward. After all, last time, we left it all on a bit of a cliffhanger, didn't we? And I bet you all rushed away there, didn't you, to, to try and work out what a third-class conditional Greek clause was and how that all played out. And you will have then have been absolutely astounded with your research and how that now opens your eyes to the reading of Scripture. Yeah, <laughs> something like that. Yeah, something like that anyway. So then, without further ado, then, we will dive back into this story. And what we'll do is we'll pick up from where we left off last week. The parable itself, as a reminder, is found in Luke chapter 12. And with that similar illustration, which the Gospel writer Matthew uses in the Gospel of Matthew 24, verses 45 to 51. And last week we took a look at the similarities between those two accounts. But what we're going to do is we're just going to read from the Luke account again. Uh, we'll pick it back up in Luke. Uh, New Living Translation is the version that I'm going to be speaking out of again for this time. And so it'll be Luke 12, 41 to 48. Peter asked, Lord, is that illustration just for us or for everyone? And the Lord replied, a faithful, sensible servant is one to whom the master can give the responsibility of managing his other household servants and feeding them. If the master returns and finds that the servant has done a good job, there'll be a reward. I tell you the truth, the master will put that servant in charge of all that he owns. But what if the servant thinks, my master won't be back for a while and he begins beating the other servants, partying and getting drunk? Well, the master will return unannounced and unexpected, and he'll cut the servant in pieces and banish him with the unfaithful. And a servant who knows what the master wants but isn't prepared and doesn't carry out those instructions will be severely punished. But someone who does not know and then does something wrong will be punished only lightly. When someone has been given much, much will be required in return. And when someone has been entrusted with much, even more will be required. So last week then, we stopped, didn't we, at verse 44, with, with that sort of thought of power potentially wafting around the disciples' heads. You know, they were the ones that would be put in charge of everything. They were the ones that would be put in charge. And there's almost that sort of sniff of power in the air there. But just before the disciples then decided to get ahead of themselves, Jesus sort of brings them back to reality with a very big bump. And he does so by chucking out another question. And he does so using that third class conditional Greek clause in verse 45. And as I said, you've been on that cliffhanger for uh, a week now. And this is how Jesus steers through that teaching. Look at verse 45 here. But what if the servant thinks? So, so the bit of interest is, is highlighted blue. And I, and I do this to show just how quickly we can actually just skim over detail in English. But it does actually have some significance in the original language, if we were to understand the original language. In this case, the Greek language. So, pin your ears back. We're going to learn a little bit, or at least attempt to. So, we have four classes in Greek for the conditional sentence, using that little word, if. And the different combinations of moods then lead to a different presentation of a conditional relationship in time and likelihood. Got all that? No. So what is a conditional sentence? I hear you cry. You might cry very quietly. Some of you might cry, no, please don't do this. But anyway, a conditional sentence consists of two clauses. All right? The if clause, which is called the protasis, that which is set out beforehand, i.e. the condition, and the result clause, which is called the apodosis, 
that which is given back, the response, the conclusion, the result, or the consequence. Protasis, apodosis, if. And you're all sitting here going, oh, really? And so this is, it gets better. This is reflected like this. Number one, we have a first class conditional sentence, a simple condition, the condition of assumed reality. Number two, we have a second class conditional sentence, which is a contrary to fact condition, the condition of assumed unreality. Number three, <laughs> mate, you're shaking your head now, you should have seen me yesterday. Right. Number three, we have a third class conditional sentence, which is a future condition, the condition of assumed probability. And then number four, we have a fourth class conditional sentence, the condition of assumed possibility. It's all very complicated, isn't it? It's all very complicated. It's all very complicated. You know what? And I don't pretend to understand it. I really don't. I have trouble spotting the difference between a noun and a verb, let alone a protasis and apodosis. You know, I really do. I, 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 my head doesn't work very well that way. So, so what I've tried to do is I've tried to sort of distill this down to a real easy way of understanding that I have drew from something that I heard many, many years ago, and it just simplifies this whole if thing in the Greek. So whenever you read if in English... It's going to be one of these four conditions. Probably not the fourth one because that's incredibly, incredibly rare. Um, so the four classes go like this in very simplified format. This is the way that I understand it. That's a bit too technical for me. So the way I understand it like this. If and it is so. If and it is not so. If and maybe it's so or maybe it's not. If and I wish it was so, but it probably isn't. So that's the way I sort of distill that down. If and it is so, if and it is not so, if and maybe it's so, maybe it's not. If and I wish it was so, but it probably isn't. So when Satan says to Jesus, if you're the son of God, it's a first class condition. If and it is so. It's not a, if and it is not so, wasn't a second class condition. But in our English, it's just if, right? And we don't know whether it's a first, second, third, or fourth. It's just if. So some of the translators will try and add other words to sort of build out the, the sort of nuance of that. But anyway, so the New Living Translation translates this, but what if? Because it's a third class condition. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But what if? And they do so because this, for all in practical purposes, is a hypothetical condition. But what if? Maybe it is, maybe it isn't, but what if? I don't know about you and your normal sort of day-to-day -day life, but I deal with um, quite a fair bit of what we call scenario generation. It's a term, scenario generation. So what you do is you set up a hypothesis or you, or you take a piece of work and then what you do is you generate a whole load of uh, hypothetical situations to test against the piece of work or to test against the hypothesis. And you do that by asking the but what if question. Well, we think this, but what if that? Well, we're looking at this, but what if that? And Jesus is doing the same in verse 45. But what if? Hypothetically speaking, but what if the servant thinks? But what if the servant thinks? Maybe he does, maybe he doesn't. I don't know, I'm just saying, but what if? But what if? And when he says thinks here in the Greek it actually says what if the servant should say in his heart it's not it's 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 here but what if the servant should say in his heart that's what the Greek says the heart what if the servant should say in his heart the heart you see the heart the heart's where it all goes wrong isn't it the heart is where it all goes wrong. And when Jesus refers to that, he isn't talking about that rather important organ that has the responsibility for, for, for pumping blood around the body. He's talking about the seat of emotions. In the Hebrew, it's lev, the heart. It's, it's the seat of emotions. It's the seat of intellectual life. That's what the heart is. Modern psychologists assign three special functions to the mind. Knowing, feeling, willing. 
And all of those functions that modern psychologists use, they're all attributed to the heart by the biblical writers. So all of those things, knowing, feeling, willing, are all attributed to the heart by the writers of the Bible. Look at Proverbs 4.23. Guard your hearts above all else, for it determines the course of your life. See, that place where, where your thoughts are pulled together. Keep a guard on it. Be mindful of it. See, you only need to put a guard on something that's going to escape, don't you? Think of that prisoner in the cell there. You know, it's that thing that's going to escape. They're guarded because they will, given half the chance, they will try and escape. And it's the same with all the lousy thinking that we do. All the lousy, rubbish thinking that we do. If we don't actually guard that thinking, what does it do? It escapes. The thinking escapes. And once it's out there, it can become quite dangerous. And then what it can do is it can start to determine our course of living. Guard your hearts, says the writer of Proverbs. Guard your hearts. So my wife is always telling me that I live one step above doom. I live one step above doom in my thinking. We're doomed, eh, Captain Manning? We're doomed. And she says, this is what I live like. I live just one step above doom all the time. And I need to be on guard about that. I need to be on guard because otherwise the black dog, which is chasing me down the road, one day may overtake me. And then he may set my path for me. So I need to be on guard. I need to guard my heart. Guard your hearts. Manage the way you think. You have control over it, you know. It doesn't have control over you. You have control over how you think. That great prophet Jeremiah notes in Jeremiah 17, 9 to 10. The human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? But I, the Lord, search all hearts and examine secret motives. I give all people their due rewards according to what their actions deserve. The heart, the most deceitful of all things, desperately wicked. It's a great resume, isn't it, for the heart? But God knows this, which is why God examines the heart of folk. What is it that really underlies their motivation for something? What really is the driving issue that makes people do things? We, we've even got that saying, don't we? Let's get to the heart of the matter. I don't know if it's a common saying over here, but let, let's get to the heart of the matter. Let's get to the heart of the matter, meaning let's really strip this all back and find out what the actual reason is for what's happening. Let's really get to the truth of it. And God himself identifies the root of the problem with all of people. Look at the following, Deuteronomy 30, verse 6. The Lord your God will change your heart and the hearts of all your descendants, so that you will love him with all your heart and soul, and so you may live. The prophet Ezekiel in Ezekiel 36, 26 says... And I'll give you a new heart, and I'll put a new spirit in you. I will take out your stony, stubborn heart, and I'll give you a tender, responsive heart. And this isn't about carrying on some form of sort of surgical operation, by the way. This is about addressing the fundamental way we think. You see, the heart is not only the organ that gives life, it's the place where you think. It's the place where you make choices. It's the place where you feel emotions. And it's ultimately the place where you try and make sense of this world. It's completely fundamental to everything. Which I think is why Paul makes it very clear that the, the heart is actually really foundational to Christian faith. The heart is really foundational to Christian faith. If you were to look at that um, letter that he wrote to the church in Rome, and we'll just take two verses, Romans 10, 9 to 10, you'll all know this. But what I've done is just added something behind heart to amplify it. Romans 10, 9 to 10. If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, the place where you think, where you make choices, where you feel emotions and ultimately try and make sense of the world, 
that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. For it's by believing in your heart, that place where you think, where you make choices, where you feel emotions, and when you, where you ultimately you try and make sense of the world, it's in that place that you're made right with God. And it's by openly declaring your faith that you're saved. See, it's more than just a series of words which are uttered at a point of conversion. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. I'm not saying that isn't a good starter for ten. But it's really light on what that is actually all about. It's really light. You, you think about that prayer. And if you were to actually apply the understanding of what that heart really is. Think about that. Lord Jesus, I want you to come into the place where I think. I want you to come into the place where I make choices. I want you to come into the place where I feel emotions. And I want you to come into the place where ultimately I can try and make sense of the world. I want you in that place. And it's there, right in all those places, that I want you to be my Lord. Now that is an altar call. That is an altar call. Because it's here then, Jesus moves the focus on, doesn't he? So... He set it up, this is about the heart, this is about where you think, this is about where you feel, this is about where your emotions are, this is about where you make sense of the world. But we need to keep in mind that Jesus isn't addressing that servant. He's addressing the servant that would have been put in charge had he found doing the things that you ought to be doing. He would have been put in charge. And I see this as a dire warning, actually, for leaders, for those who are looking after folk in the absence of the master. Because it's this guy that verse 45 is really directed at. And Jesus goes on to say that that servant thinks in his heart. He begins to make choices. He begins to toss up different options. Now, they may not be options that we would take, you know, partying, drinking, whatever. They may not be options. But what we're looking at is the principle, not the exact same scenario. And so the servant in verse 45 starts mulling thoughts over in his thinking, doesn't he? His thinking, his heart. Ah, the boss is away. The boss is away. Oh, cat's away. Mice will play. The boss is away. I can now start to behave as I want. I can now start to flex my muscles over the, over the people that are around me. I can start to overlord those people who work with me. In fact, I can, I can start to behave however I want. I can have a wild time. I can, I can do whatever I want. My will. My will over the master's will my will over God's will and we all know when that happened don't we the rise of humanity right back in the garden right back in that story in Eden the right of humans to choose the right of humans to decide the right of humans to to elevate self above God and you know what nothing's changed since same old story Round and round and round and round we go. There really is absolutely nothing new under the sun when it comes to how humanity behaves. There really isn't. Better technology today, but humans, we're all still the same. We're all still the same. You've only got to look around at the situation that we find today in the world that we are now living in and how quickly humans revert to some form of tribalism. We may not tag it as tribalism, But it is. You're in this group. Oh, you're in that group. Oh, you're in another group. And we go into little tribes. It's what we do. And all of a sudden, things are then segregated. And all of a sudden, there is then division. And things like that become rife. Jesus then goes on, doesn't he, in verse 46. The master's going to return unannounced, unexpected, and he'll cut that servant in pieces and banish him with the unfaithful. When the master does return, it's going to be at an unannounced time, and it's going to be at an unexpected time. So, unannounced, unexpected. Always keep that in mind. Unannounced, unexpected. So any Christian that thinks, oh, that's okay, Jesus is going to be here in the next five minutes, No. 
unannounced, unexpected. And when he does, he's going to be less than happy, apparently. In fact, Jesus uses the description of a very, very cruel punishment that the Hebrews used to use back in the day. Other nations used it as well. But he uses a very, very particular description of punishment. In the Greek, it's the word uh, dichotomeo, dichotomeo. And quite literally, it means to cut an object into two halves. Literally then, this servant is going to be dismembered. Cut into two halves. Not only dismembered, but then banished with those who are unfaithful or unbelieving. The Greek word is apistos. Apistos. Which means those who are without trust in God. So that servant who's been given charge over the people, when the master comes back, because he's not been doing what he should have been doing, is going to be cut in half and banished with those who have no trust in God. Think about that. This servant is someone who's working for the master. Someone who's supposed to be associated with the master. But the servant begins to allow his thinking his mind, his will, his emotions to rule himself. And in doing so, he begins to live a life that is inconsistent with what the master expects to see when he returns. So, when the master does return, he punishes that servant by severing him and assigning him to the same group that have got no belief. Assigning him with those that are unfaithful. Let's extrapolate that to us. Let's put ourselves in the place of that servant in this story, the master being God. You see, we're all supposed to be in the employ of God, aren't we? We're all supposed to be in the employ of God through our relationship with Jesus. Because we're supposed to be a people that are easily recognisable as folk who are his, who are his followers. But how often do we allow the factors of our heart, the mind, the will, the emotions to cloud our thinking, to ultimately start to direct our thinking so that our life starts to track off down another route, down another pathway. Our will above his will. Our way instead of his way. And we all know what that ends up with. As soon as it's our way above his way, it's the wrong way, right? And we live our life with, with very little expectation of, re of his return, to be honest. Because... I don't think the church today, as a rule, really lives with a theology of imminence underpinning the existence. Imminence. That Christ could step back any moment. Now, we don't live our lives like that. We're always looking for, oh, well, this has got to happen, this has got to happen, this has got to happen, this has got to happen. Yeah, well, no, no, it's not going to happen. And so we can almost just cruise along. Because the third temple hasn't been built in Israel yet, has it? And Jesus won't come back until the third temple's built. Hasn't happened. We can just cruise along. No. Theology of imminence. Jesus can come back whenever he wants. Imminence. Well, he's not come back for 2,000 plus years. He's unlikely to do so now in my lifetime. So I might as well just kick back. Do what I want. Live like I want. But he does step back into time. He will step back into time. And when he does so, he's expecting the people that are called by his name to actually be living a life in a way that honours him and reflects him. That's us, you know. That's us. We're that people. What's he going to find? A bunch of folks who are apathetic, uncommitted, more interested in what they want and their views than what he wants and his views? Don't know. Only you know. So what he does when he does return is he severs us. After all, we're supposed to be part of his body, aren't we? One body, one church. The only thing that he can do to remove us is to dismember us sever us and then he assigns us with those who don't believe 
He signs us with those who don't have trust or belief in him. Because the heart, the place where I think, the place where I make choices, where I feel emotions, and where I ultimately try and make sense of the world was never really his anyway. Never really his. I may have said some words years ago, but this never played out in reality within our hearts. Because we've never really lived what he said. We've never really lived what we say we believe. And you know what? Ultimately, we reap consequences. And then Jesus points out this almost like sliding scale of punishment, depending on who is left. Verse 47 notes this. And a servant who knows what the master wants, but isn't prepared and doesn't carry out those instructions, will be severely punished. See, this is a different servant. This is a different servant to one that has been or would have been given control over the master's affairs. This is the guy who, despite knowing what the master wants to be done, just isn't prepared to do it. For whatever reason, this person doesn't carry out the instructions that are given to them. In the Greek, this is the guy who didn't do according to his will. Which should really make us ask that question, what is the will of God? We know the answer to that, don't we? The general will of God is to conform you to the likeness of his son. That's the general will of God, to conform you to the likeness of his son. The specific will of God is actually all about carrying out the mission that he's given each one of us to do. And if you're not sure what that mission is, I'd suggest that you read about it in the book of Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 5, 19 to 20. For God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us... Us, this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. You want to know what your mission is? There's your mission. How are we tracking with that? How are we tracking with that? Back to the parable then. I wonder what type of servant would represent there today. Perhaps the man or woman of God who professes to know Jesus, but is actually well, it's just a Sunday thing. Tick the box exercise. I put a smile at pastor up there. I don't think that's necessary, but I, it's, a, it's a good thing to put on the tick the box exercise. Tick the box exercise. You know, I said that sinner's prayer way back when. And now it's just a case of going through the motions case of going through the motions yes i know that jesus expects something from me but i'm pretty busy now i don't have time to do all of this church stuff and besides you don't have to go to church or or be involved in order to believe you just don't have to do that i believe i just don't do i believe i just don't do there'll be a time in the future be a time in the future sometime when there's a bit more bandwidth for me to try and get involved in that church stuff till then i'm i'm pretty busy just sort of sorting out my life tick the boxes Jesus warns if that's the way you carry on not being ready not doing the will of the master the outcome's going to be severe the Greek word describes flaying the skin or a large heavy beating it's rendered severely punished here but the Greek word is actually the term used for flaying of the skin this is a really vivid picture that Jesus is painting and it, and it would have shocked his listeners. The flay, and if you know what flaying the skin is, it's really unpleasant. It would really have shocked his listeners. Because this is directed at people who should know better. It isn't that they don't know the master's will. It's that they choose to ignore it by failing to prepare and by failing to do. No, prepare, Do. These aren't folk who have never met Jesus. These are, these are folk who are just apathetic about their walk. They know, but they don't prepare, and they certainly don't do. In his book, The Pursuit of God, A.W. Tozer writes this. Millions call themselves by his name. It is true, and pay some token homage to him. But a simple test will show how little he is really honoured among them. Let the average man be put to the proof on the question of who or what is above 
and his true position will be exposed. Let him be forced into making a choice between God and money, between God and men, between God and personal ambition, between God and self, God and human love. And God will take second place every time. Those other things will be exalted above. However the man may protest, the proof is in the choice that he makes day after day throughout his life. We're not saved through our works, thankfully. We're not saved through our works, but the way we live our life, the choices we make, and how they then play out is a pretty good measure of whether we are actually saved or not. We're not saved by our works. <laughs> by their fruits, you'll know them. And we touched on that, didn't we, last week? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. All demonstrated in a Christ-filled life. And used to further the will of God by calling folk to him for reconciliation. And then Jesus goes on in verse 48. But someone who does not know and then does something wrong will be punished only lightly. So, so the servant here, the servant who doesn't know the master's will, the one who has no frame of reference to work from, this one, in complete distinction to the previous two servants that we've mentioned, this one is also going to be punished, but the punishment will be lighter. Now, in the Greek, this is an individual who will receive only a flu, few blows. A few blows. It's still going to be flayed. The punishment is exactly the same. It's still a flaying, but it will be a few blows. The type of punishment is the same, but the level will be light in terms of intensity. What was it that Peter asked that kicked off this whole thing? Luke 12, 41, Peter asked, Lord, is that illustration just for us or for everyone? You see, Peter was referring back to that previous parable, wasn't he? The expectant steward. But then moving forward, Jesus is using this illustration. Jesus is laying out a picture that indicates, indicates that there is a, a degree of severity in terms of punishment that is consummate with the offence. Jesus is producing and presenting a sliding scale in view to determine the scale of offence which is actually linked to knowledge and what you've actually done with that knowledge. No prepared do. No prepared do. Don't know. Haven't prepared. Don't do. Sliding scale. Chuck Swindoll notes this. I can't help but have the same reservations that our Lord seems to suggest here about those who do not know the truth. I do not believe that those people will face the same degree and measure of judgment as that which will fall upon people who hear the gospel again and again and again, but refuse to accept it or refuse to receive it. You see, however it pans out, we need to keep this in mind. God is just. And the judgment of God will be absolutely spot on. There will be no retrials, there'll be no miscarriages of justice, there'll be no wrong convictions, there'll be no appeals to a higher authority. None. You see, what God says is the bottom line. So however he judges, you can be sure of one thing. It's right. It's right. To refer back to A.W. Tozer, he notes this. Justice is not something that God has. Justice is something that God is. Not something God has, something God is. So the argument, how could a just and loving God do this or that, well, really doesn't hold any water, to be honest. Because if God is indeed God, then he's completely just. And if there's no God, then all this bad stuff is just as a result of rubbish humanity. And so why on earth be so big on humanity? <laughs> Don't blame a... God who you don't believe in for something that humans do. Humanity lets you down all the time. We all know that. The sooner that the broader collective realise it, the better. Because perhaps then we'll start to look for that one thing that won't let us down. That one person that won't let us down. That rock. That place of safety. That place of security which is found only in the person of Jesus. 
Because Jesus then continues with the rest of that verse. When someone has been given much, much will be required in return. And when someone has been entrusted with much, even more will be required. Just think about that. Think about what has been given to this world. When someone has been given much, what has been given to this world? Aside from all of the things that we take for granted on a daily basis, what has been given to this world? If you think about that on a cosmic scale, God gave his only begotten son. How much was that? I would suggest much. How much will be required in return? Again, I would suggest much will be required. And this age that we live in, this period of grace, is not without some significant cost at some point, because there's no such thing as a free lunch. No such thing. We have been given much, and there is an expectation that sits behind that. Those who have been entrusted with much. In the Greek word, that word there that's entrusted can also mean to deposit. So for those who have received a deposit into their lives, even more is going to be expected from those folk. The world may have been given the sun, but who's been deposited with the sun? All of us who profess Jesus as Lord, haven't we got that deposit in us? We're the ones entrusted, entrusted. Even more is going to be required of these folk. The whole story is an illustration directed across the spectrum. Firstly, at those who exercise the master's authority, which in my mind links to church leadership or those who step into leadership positions. Secondly, all those who profess to know the will of the master, but don't do it. Believers in general. Believers in general. And then thirdly, those who haven't got a clue. The rest of the world. But each one has a responsibility, and each one of those groups, each one of those groups will have an outcome based on whatever that responsibility is that they've been given. For all of us who profess Jesus as Lord, We have been entrusted with much. Therefore, even more is required of us. The standards that are set for us and our living are far greater than those set for others around us. God expects a bigger return from the people he has deposited with. Never let anyone fool you into thinking that this Christian walk is a breeze. Because it really isn't. It is demanding. It is staggeringly hard because it requires each one of us to really and genuinely say, Lord Jesus, I want you to come into the place where I think. I want you to come into the place where I make my choices. I want you to come into the place where I feel my emotions and where ultimately I try and make sense of this world. And it's there, it's right in all those places that I want you to be Lord. You, the one who is in control of all of my life. That's where I want you. And that leaves no corner of your life out of his touch. No corner of your life is out of bounds. Not one corner of your life is out of his reach Not one. That's what it means to invite Jesus into your heart. I bet Peter wished he'd never asked the question, to be honest. The parable ends, and Jesus continues to paint a picture which is worth reading for you to follow up with at some point. It's sobering what Jesus then moves into after the parable. But we've closed off on that parable now. But we've done so on a note of expectation. And I would encourage each one of us to consider this. What have you been given? Because much is expected. What have you been entrusted with? Even more will be required. So this is not the time for faint-heartedness. 
This is not the time for complacency. This is a time to show what spirit indwells you by the fruits your life produces and to demonstrate something that is so radically different to things that we see currently going on around this world outside of these walls. And the church as one body, the body of Christ, should be the place where all of that is played out. It should be a place of difference and a place that will not be found wanting when Jesus steps back into time. We've all got a part to play, and may we each play our part well. So bless you folk, go well. Grace and peace to you, may they be with you all this week. Let's just pray. Lord, may we each one of us, Lord, be attentive so that we do know, prepare, and do your will. We all recognise, Lord, that lip service alone isn't good enough. And we live in a time, Lord, when folk make excuses for everything. But you, you see the heart. You see what really motivates us. You see what really drives us. And you know exactly what actually fuels us. We can kid ourselves. We can justify things for ourselves, but you see right through us. And may each one of us, Lord, deeply and genuinely want to reflect you to this world. Not for our benefit, but for your glory and for your name's sake. And I pray, Lord, that you would meet with your people here, that you would work closely in the lives of everyone who has heard this message, so that you would be presented well to this world in which we live in which we move and I thank you for the privilege that you've given us we don't take it lightly and we recognize Lord that as we have been given much there is much expectation on us and may we not let you down Lord and I pray that when you do return you'll be pleased with our efforts however feeble they may seem so thank you Lord and we commit this upcoming week to you, that your will would be carried out here on earth as it is in heaven. And in your name we pray. Amen.